Energize your body with a delicious blend of 23 organic superfoods and Paleo Valley's organic super grains. Click the link in the description or pinned comment below to save 15%. Alan, welcome back to the podcast. How you doing? Hey, Jesse. I'm doing good. Glad to be with you. Excited to chat about thyroid today. And you have a really unique perspective on how to treat the thyroid, I have to say, because a lot of functional medicine practitioners, and you talk about this in the new book, actually use high dose iodine when treating thyroid dysfunction. So your, your approach is on the other end of the spectrum, lessening our iodine intake. So talk about, first of all, how did you first come across this? You know, funny thing, I guess the arc of my iodine understanding, uh, if you go back enough, it would have been not really a whole lot of depth, just the basic knowledge about chemistry, the thyroid needs some iodine to work, not a lot past that. Then I guess just the awareness of it being used in medicine in various ways, you know, skin antiseptic or whatnot. And somewhere around late 90s, early 2000s, I became aware of a, a small but growing fad of using megadose iodine. And I learned about it because I had patients who were developing thyroid disease from attempting these things, people that really wouldn't have otherwise. And so I got a little more into it and I realized that, yeah, we need some, it's a good thing at a certain point, but way too much can be harmful. And for quite a while, that's about where it was. And in the recent years, some new studies showed that, you know, all those things are true, but the level that's harmful was lower than we thought. And then also that for some, there may be an opportunity to reverse disease by lowering it. So that's kind of how that all unfolded. So where does somebody start? Say they have a thyroid disease right now and they've maybe had it chronically for a period of time. Maybe they're even on a thyroid medication. How does somebody go about assessing how much iodine they're taking in on a regular basis? Well, so I guess the that's a very logical question. To step back, I would say, is it helpful to assess? Are there good ways to assess? And it's tricky because iodine is a hard thing to measure. You know, That's why you don't see it on food ingredient lists or like nutritional facts labels, or even like on web food analyzers or you know apps that track your diet or whatnot. It's not in any of those things. So yeah, if there were a simple way to say, how many micrograms am I getting? How much is in my body? That would be a good thing to do, but it's, there's no great ways to do that. And even further, the studies that have shown that iodine reduction may help thyroid disease, some of them did go through the painstaking efforts of trying to track people's intake beforehand or look at their levels. And it turned out that neither was predictive of success. It wasn't just that were those that were here or here would get better. What happens is that a lot of the iodine can be trapped in the thyroid and someone could have a big intake a long time ago and then a quite reasonable intake afterward, but still have this excess that's trapped. So the best way to predict that is to try it and see if it helps, really. <laughs> and how long does the thyroid store iodine for? Yeah, so normal intake, if you're talking about amounts that are within the realm of what we need, six to eight weeks. But if there's a higher than necessary intake, it can, it can hold on to that for a year or better. Uh, so yeah, I can have it trapped for quite a while. And the protocol you talk about in this book, doing a reset and then a maintenance phase where we're looking at taking our iodine level and, and bringing down our intake through food and other means. Would you say this is for everybody these days or just people that have a known thyroid condition? Yeah, great question. So a couple of thoughts, you know, the maintenance ideas, I think makes sense for most people. Uh, you don't really know if you're apt to get thyroid disease until you have it. So, so yeah, those that do have it, they know that they are prone to it. And those of us who don't, Pretty much anyone could get it given enough chemical stressors on the thyroid, but some people it just happens much more easily. So I, I don't have thyroid disease, but after learning a lot of these things, I have changed in the things that I do on a daily basis for myself and my family. So I, I want to be preventive. So let's talk about what happens specifically in the thyroid when we're taking in too much. How does it respond? The thyroid needs iodine as a building block for making hormones. And there's a special protein called thyroglobulin. And thyroglobulin has like uh, 13 different spots onto which iodine can attach. And if it's got those spots filled up, you know, like 11 to 13 spots filled up, it works just fine. However, when there's a lot of iodine moving in the thyroid, it can get in the wrong places. And it's a, it's a powerful compound. You know, it generates a lot of free radicals. And that's why it's used as a skin antiseptic. It's kind of like bleach or hydrogen peroxide. So when too much of that gets on that protein, it just generates free radical stress and that damages the protein. It can destroy the adjoining cells of the thyroid. 
it can pull in immune cells. You know, they get brought in from all the signs of inflammation. And also the immune cells can start to look uh, at the thyroid proteins as if they're foreign. You know, they become antigenic. They look like they don't belong there. So the body starts the attack against it. But that's the, that's the general cycle. And typically the way it's looked at Hashimoto's, which is the body attacking itself, and it's actually a condition I know quite readily because my wife suffers from it. And it's a really common condition. When people get that, it's assumed that they're going to just have to deal with the symptoms for life and manage the symptoms. With your, with your new protocol, you're saying we can actually help with the symptoms, but also reverse that condition in a way. Talk more about that. It's a more optimistic uh, way of looking at it. It is. And I loved how you talked about the symptoms in reversing as distinct things because they really are. And that brings out a big point. So there's different categories of people. There's those to where they say they, they just barely found they had abnormal thyroid levels. They've not been on treatment for some time. Their symptoms are not that major. And then there are those on the other end to where they have no thyroid. You know, it was taken out. Uh, perhaps they're symptomatic. They're on medications. So people in that second category, there is not a high chance of them regrowing thyroid function. I wouldn't say never. I actually have seen that happen. They, they, <laughs> their surgery wasn't as complete as they thought in retrospect. But no, by and large, they'll need long-term treatment. However, their body doesn't respond well to thyroid hormones due to this iodine excess as well. So yeah, those who have earlier stage disease, uh, there's still some thyroid function remaining they still have a lot to gain in terms of improving symptoms, and they also may gain a lot in terms of their function coming back again. And this is something that, you know, when we were talking last time, I can't remember how many years ago, uh, if we would gone not much further back from there, I, I wouldn't have been aware of this, and I wouldn't have been out this optimistic about how much recovery is possible for people. But per the multiple controlled clinical trials, they average at about two-thirds recovery rate, and between about like 60 and 80% per the study. So, and by recovery, I mean, you know, full stop, uh, they don't need treatment in any way. They have normal levels and their symptoms are gone. You talked about the thyroid being destroyed and, and sometimes that's done as a medical procedure for people with hyperthyroid. Mm -hmm. In that case, if somebody is without a thyroid right now, how does that change how they go about, you know, regulating their iodine intake? Because all the iodine in a healthy person is going to the thyroid and making thyroid hormones. But with this person not having a thyroid, does it accumulate in the body more? Do they have to be even more careful of, of how much they're taking in? Well, the same things the same things largely apply because there's still the idea of what's the, the what what they're taking in medication that accounts for what the thyroid would have made normally. So there's really not a need for iodine otherwise. And that makes it to where it won't hurt their cells because they have none. But the extra, what it does do is it creates thyroid resistance. So it's not so much the iodine builds up, but it is that the body resists the hormones. And, and that's why so many in situations like that, they could take hormones that on paper should suffice for what their bodies need. But when you survey these people, you know, almost all of them are symptomatic. One, one big survey was done in 2018, uh, 12,000 people were asked about this. And it was a website hosted by thyroid care advocates. And of them, it was over 20% that had seen 10 or more doctors. And it was fewer than 6% who consider their treatment highly effective. So it's a lot of folks are just suffering out there. And the numbers are just staggering. You talk about in the book how this is such a recent phenomenon where people are suffering more and more from thyroid disease. And your take on that, is that primarily because of the iodine? You know, there's, there's kind of chapters in that if we think about it relative to the United States, for example. So we've got pre-1920s, we've got 1920s to 1980s, and we've got like later 80s to present. So pre-1920s, there was no iodine fortification. And there were pockets of the country in which the soils were really iodine poor. You know, it's funny, now we espouse local food, and it's a cool thing. However, if that's all you've got and your local soil is devoid of some nutrients, that's not good. <laughs> so in past times, all there was was local food, and some areas didn't have the same nutritional soils that others did. And yeah, some areas were deficient. And the main way that would manifest at that level of deficiency was pediatric goiter. So a lot of kids had swollen necks. And it was an unfortunate thing. It caused problems. And so salt fortification, you know, adding iodine to salt, 
it largely reversed that. You know, the rates of goiter in the worst areas went from like 30 some odd percent down to a few percent. So it was a big success. However, in the same areas, in the same time frame, the rate of autoimmune thyroid disease in women 30s, 40s, and 50s increased 26 fold. So, so yeah, after iodine fortification, thyroid disease in chronic in adults that was chronic had pretty much never existed before. It was quite a rare thing, and it suddenly became a rather common thing. So that stayed at a relative consistent threshold through about early 80s, mid 80s, and then late 80s, early 90s. That's when this all started on the uptick, and that's been thyroid cancer, autoimmune disease in general, and then chronic thyroid disease. And you mentioned women there. Do you know specifically why women have higher cases of thyroid disease? Yeah, a couple of big theories. So the, the biggest single factor, we we have rather similar requirements for iodine. Most of the differences are just based upon body size, but we have different tolerance of iodine. So some people can get away with the occasional excess with just no consequences. There are gender differences in how enzymes are set up to clear extra iodine. So one thing that's different is women can't clear the excess as well. So that's a big one. Then some of the other genes that seem to relate to thyroid disease, many of them are X-linked. So, you know, we've got one X chromosome, women have two. So if there are genes with more latent traits, they're more apt to show up because of that pair. Um, another theory is that post-pregnancy, some of the cells from the baby may cross the placenta, end up in the body, and get treated as foreign, uh, fetal cell microchimerism. And that's part of why women have more rates of autoimmune disease in general, we think. But yeah, about a six, six to 10 to one ratio for women to men for autoimmune thyroid disease. That's a big difference. Yeah. And when it comes to pregnancy and breastfeeding, do women require more iodine at that time? You know, a little bit. That's actually been a fascinating topic that's hot, rapidly evolving in research. They need a little bit more. However, the old idea of iodine supplementation with pregnancy is on its last legs. There was a large review done by the Cochrane Review Group, and they're pretty respected for doing you know, non-bias, taking questions and pulling together lots of data and analyzing that. What they concluded was that iodine supplementation in pregnancy does not improve mom's thyroid health, does not improve mom's overall health, does not improve baby's thyroid health, does not improve baby's overall health, uh, does raise mom's thyroid antibodies and often worsens mom's morning sickness. And what about kids, like young kids when they're born, um, even up to teens, as kids are developing, do they have a higher need for iodine at that time? Not higher than one would expect per body size. So they, we all need it at all ages. And the cool thing is that when our diets now have food from a variety of sources, uh, there are there's iodine fortified in some things, and then inadvertently iodines in a lot of other foods, we just don't see iodine deficiency in the modern world anymore. And that, that's been a really big success. What about anywhere in the world, developing nations? Is there still deficiency in different pockets? You know, fascinating question. So the World Health Organization has categorized different levels, and they talk about severe, mild, severe, moderate, and mild iodine deficiency. And severe is where we see clear increased rates of pediatric disease, uh, sometimes adult disease. Odd thing about mild iodine deficiency, that's where we see some of the lowest rates of adult thyroid disease. Uh, back in 92, 112 nations were at severe iodine deficiency. And it was tragic. There was literally probably about a billion people that were on the globe at one point that didn't have proper brain development because of a simple lack of a nutrient. They didn't have good thyroid function because of that. And thankfully, some strong efforts were put into place to reverse that. So between 92 to 2014, one of the biggest successes in public health, that 112 number was brought down to zero. So there are now no nations on earth that are categorized as severely iodine deficient. However, during that same time frame, those that are categorized as at risk for thyroid disease due to iodine excess went from zero to 52. So yeah, we're, we're one of those 52. And was that a dramatic decrease in deficiency all due to fortification of foods? Largely, and then also due to just reductions of extreme poverty and less reliance solely on local local. Uh, subsistence type farming. So they basically just got more variety in their diet in general. That was a big win in general. Uh, not in many cases they were subsisting off of a monocrop. 
like they had corn, you know, end of list for the diet, you know, and just locally grown corn or like one or two grain products. So a lot of it was just better nutritional status, like more foodstuffs being added to the diet. And yeah, there were cases to where fortification was part of it as well. And now that we're on the other end of the spectrum and we're looking at minimizing our exposure to iodine, what foods are being fortified these days? Let's start there with the fortification so we know what foods to avoid. And that's an interesting thing. So I think about this in different ways. There's, there's the foods that are fortified, like you mentioned, where iodine is deliberately added in for nutritional purposes. There's foods that have naturally occurring substantial amounts of iodine, mostly stuff from the ocean. Then we've got foods to where iodine is part of ultra processing. And a lot of that comes down to baked products uh, and dairy products to where iodine is used as a conditioner, a texturizer, a stabilizer. Then we have iodine as a contaminant. And that's mostly relevant for topical cosmetic products. Then also, again, dairy products. It's used in the process of sanitizing the cow's teats during milking and also added to their foods. And that ends up causing a contaminant effect upon the final dairy products from them. Sticking on dairy products a little bit longer here, is there any difference between conventional and organic dairy when it comes to the way that they're, you know, treating the teats with the iodine and, and our exposure down the line? You know, it's a fascinating thing, and I went so deep in the story. Uh, as a generalization, the iodine content in organic dairy often runs a little lower, not enough to make a categorical change for most people, but it often is somewhat lower. And the biggest difference of that is they consume more types of just uh, alfalfa, more, more raw plant foods. Many of those have iodine binding properties. So they often get a little bit lower for that reason with organic. And as far as teat sanitizer, that's not yet a distinction between regular commercial and organic farming. However, there are a lot of products that are starting to appear on the market and some more that are about to come in the market that can do that job better and safer. Uh, iodine is expensive for the farmers. It, it's an irritant to the, to the udders and they, they want other options. So that may be less of a factor in the coming years. And what about other sources of dairy, such as sheep and goat? Are, there, are they better options for people or are they pretty much in the same boat? You know, the assays that I've seen suggest that, they, that they're similar. There's, there's not a lot of data, you know. I, if you go on the web and look at iodine content in food, you could spend, no lie, an hour Googling and you'll find the same 12 foods on four or five websites and that's about it. Uh, you won't see it on Nutrient Facts or Chronometer or anything else like that. So I dug hard and pulled a lot of data from USDA reports and I finally got about 600 foods, each with about 50 samples. And so I averaged and showed some analysis of, uh, you know, bell curve distribution. And there were some foods that were generally low, but every now and then had like a big outlier. So when I put together the list in the diet, I said, hey, look, even the things that were normally okay, but sometimes could be way off the charts, I encourage people to avoid those during that stage in which they're trying to really help their thyroid get better. And since this is coming from the top down in the milk itself, I'm assuming we you would have to avoid things like cheese and yogurt and products made from that milk. Yeah. And the way I set it up is that there's two ways to use the, the diet. There's trying to actively improve upon things. And that's what I call the whole reset stage. And that's where someone's got thyroid disease. Uh, they've, they've got some symptoms. They want their thyroid to get better. They want to lower the symptoms. And that's done for a set period of time. It could be one to nine months. I kind of walk through the process of that in the book. And during that, you just do green light foods. It's super easy. I just broke down all the foods into green light, yellow light, and red light. And the cool thing is that there's tons of options in every food category in the green light range. So you got a lot of stuff to pick from. Once someone has achieved their goals uh, and they just wish to stabilize, or someone just coming into it wanting to not trigger thyroid disease, they, same thing, green light foods are great. They can also add in one to two servings of yellow light foods per day. So a lot of dairy things I've put in that yellow light list where they're, they're pretty consistent, pretty predictable, and at a reasonable serving size, it's enough to where it wouldn't push you over the edge. Okay, so we went pretty deep into the dairy there. Let's talk about fortified foods. What foods these days in Western culture are being fortified with iodine? So deliberately fortified, yeah, dairy roundabout because of the cow stuff, we covered that. So then we've got salt. So it's deliberately added in to salt. And some salt has it naturally occurring. Some salt has it put in on purpose. Well, there's so many different kinds of salt there out there these days. What are, what are you using? Like, are there different options for people that want to avoid iodine when consuming salt? Or is salt something we just have to minimize or avoid altogether? 
you know, this is a great example of a pretty painless substitution. There's, there's wonderful culinary salts that have negligible amounts of iodine. And it's funny, I did a pretty, I went through a evolutionary process of this. Uh, way back when I was a huge fan of sea salt for the assumption that I was getting some useful minerals from that besides sodium chloride. Years back, I started seeing assays of mineral content in sea salt. And yeah, every mineral you can think of, there's some of that in sea salt. But doses doses matter, you know? So if you use all your salt from sea salt, you'll get some extra potassium. Your body needs three to 5,000 milligrams of potassium per day. If all your salt's from sea salt, you might gain an extra 0 0.1 milligram of potassium. <laughs> it's not changing things, you know? We we need uh, we need iron uh, per gender per size you know, twenty milligrams somewhere around there. Sea salt's got iron, and if you get all of your salt per day from sea salt, you might add in zero point two milligrams. I'm sorry, zero point zero two milligrams of iron per day on top of your diet. So you're you know so you're not really gaining much. So I thought that through, and in terms of personal use, so I realized that salt is not really a big source of nutrients. There's no no big loss that way. So what, what is it doing? Well, it's culinary purposes, you know, how the food cooks, how the food tastes. And I started looking a lot at what some of the top chefs prefer. And there's a pretty strong convergence on, I have no ties to any companies, but pretty strong convergence on diamond brand kosher salt. And a lot of their arguments are that it has nothing else in it but salt. There's like no other binders, fillers, additives, stabilizers, anti-caking agents. And, and many of them have such sensitive palates that they feel that those things are disruptive to taste. So that's one. The other thing they like about it is the physical structure of the crystals. And apparently to their nuanced eyes and, and palates, they can tell how that sticks onto the food and how it affects flavor profiles. So yeah, for cooking, I just do what the main chefs, top chefs do and do diamond brand kosher. <laughs> how much iodine could somebody get from salt? These obviously no, not the kinds that have no iodine, but the ones that do, how much could be in there? And let's talk about what that upper safe limit is for somebody that is going through a thyroid challenge right now and they need to really limit. And then what would it be for somebody in more of a maintenance phase? Yeah, perfect question and perfect request for framing it too. So uh, someone who's wanting to improve their thyroid function, the target is somewhere under 100 micrograms per day from all sources combined. Uh, someone looking at just general health, keeping it stable, we're thinking about between roughly 50 and 200 micrograms per day, all sources. And we'll talk through all these things, but yeah, the, the, the cosmetics, the supplements, the medications, the foods, you know, all the salt. And so salt, iodized salt, if someone's consuming typically about three, three grams or so of salt per day, and it's coming from iodized salt, they can walk away with about 250 micrograms of iodine from that. And that alone will put them over what we now know to be a safe upper limit for many. Uh, sea salt, I've seen a lot of assays of sea salt products, and they're all over the board. And I've seen many assays that were repeated on the same product, and they're, they're often not consistent. So I've seen two products that, that have been consistently assayed and at negligible amounts of iodine. So those who like sea salt, uh, Celtic brand, they make a light gray sea salt. They make a fine and a coarse grain of that. That one has pretty much none. It, it has not on many assays. Celtic brand makes many other lines of sea salt that do not have low levels of iodine, but their light gray one does. The other one that I, that I actually use a lot is Malden, M-A-L-D-O-N. It's this old company from the UK. They've been like, I don't know, fifth or sixth generation, and they make a finishing sea salt. Uh, the iodine content is negligible, and it's these it's these super thin, big fat snowflake looking things, you know. So you you dust that over food, and it's really not all that much salt. But like right before serving, and you eat it, and you get these this crunch, this pop of flavor. It's it's just awesome stuff. So those are and those are the ones that I like the most. Um, others in terms of their iodine content, one thing that surprised me the most was pink Himalayan salt. It's it's super popular. It's gotten a lot of press in the natural medicine world. And I reached out to manufacturers multiple times. I said, hey, look, you guys have published this assay showing the iodine content per, per kilogram. You know, I ran the math on that, converted that to reasonable units, you know, micrograms per day serving per teaspoon. Are you guys sure about the assay, about the decimals and all the placements and stuff? And, and uh, yeah, they, they, they stood by it. I'm like, okay, so basically it has twice the iodine of iodized salt. It's about five to 600 micrograms per, per day if that's your mainstay. 
Wow. So salt's a big one for people to, again, an easy switch, but it's going to make a big payoff for you. It's the easiest switch. Yeah. You lose nothing. Well, let's talk about sea vegetables and, and seafood in general. Obviously, this is the, one of the first things probably people think about when they think about iodine. So let's talk about first, what are the big culprits there that we want to watch out for? And then what are some of the healthier choices within that realm? Yeah, sea veggies, that was one in which I had some personal evolution over the years as well. You know, uh, any, I guess if you go back to prior to, hmm, prior to the early 90s, any fad, extreme, silly diet you could think of, I've I've done it <laughs> probably for some length of time. And I was hardcore macrobiotic for probably about a year. And that was a system that relied quite heavily upon sea vegetables. So I was a fan of them. I was quite indoctrinated into their various benefits. And it was a, a frustrating thing to realize that any, any amount of them really would push someone outside the edge when they were trying to watch their iodine. They're extremely high in that. And then the more I looked at it, I started looking at just how dietary sea vegetable intake correlated with human health outcomes. Uh, not just do they have certain nutrients, but what actually happens to people that consume them. Because they've got some good nutrients, but the problem is that when you indiscriminately have foods that are very dense in things, you don't always get the things you want. You can also concentrate bad minerals, you know, toxic metals, uh, radioactive type compounds. So that's been a concern. And the larger studies that have looked at epidemiology in terms of sea vegetable intake and health outcomes shown that, if anything, there's a strong risk for higher type for, for certain types of cancers, uh, including breast cancer. So I don't see it as a real loss to minimize those in the diet. A uh, couple of versions of things you could loosely categorize as sea vegetables that have reasonable amounts of iodine would include spirulina and chlorella. Uh, at servings up to about three grams per day, which is, you know, that's pretty quite generous. There's not going to be high amounts that would be problematic from that. What about cultures like the Japanese who are consuming quite a bit of sea vegetables through sushi and seaweed salad and things like that? Is there a lot of research showing what ends up happening to them long term? There is, and it's a fascinating thing. So as a generalization, they have a lot of a lot of improved health outcomes over those on, on Western diets. And of course, many factors go into that. You know, they've got a lot of good foods. There's their total food intake and whatnot. We think that there's two, there's two main genetic patterns in terms of our iodine response. So those that have been coastal for some length of time, there's much more common gene expression that allows tolerance of a bigger range of iodized foods. Those who are inland for longer periods of time, they can do better at getting by on less iodine, but they're more vulnerable against high exposures to it. So that's how we see the genetics play out. Even having said that, however, the, the Japanese have the world's highest rates of all types of thyroid disease. And it's not a coincidence that the autoimmune form was developed by a Japanese scientist first because he had the most to work from. There was a time in which it was thought that in some way, iodine may have been part of why they had lower breast cancer risks. But then studies looked at within Japanese women, if you, if you separate them out by their iodine content, those that consume the most versus the least, those that consume the most are most apt to develop breast cancer. And that correlation is borne out amongst other countries as well. And there's even been research looking at the idea of using iodine excretion as a screening tool for breast cancer. Another food, which was something that I really honed in on because I'm a big fan of is eggs. And it's not the egg whites, it's the egg yolk that contains a significant amount of the iodine. So talk about that. And again, for somebody who's going through a thyroid condition right now and trying to heal, I'm assuming they would want to avoid eggs or at least the egg yolk. Um, but for somebody like me who has a healthy thyroid, how, how many eggs can I eat you know, on a regular basis? You know, so so yellow light food and one or two of those a day, no, no big issue. And there's some things that really breaks my heart. Like, so that's one of them. They're nutrient dense foods, got a lot going for them. We'll talk about seafood, same thing. There's many types of seafood that I love and are great, but for those in those stages, it can be really high. In the big scheme of things, the last several decades, this surge of thyroid disease, the main things that changed was the amount of iodine in highly processed food. So eggs, the, the amount in eggs is rather consistent. It's not fluctuated a lot. There's really none in the egg whites. There are some subtle differences in the yolks when they're more commercial raised or more free range, you know, pasture fed and whatnot. Uh, again, not enough to where it totally changes their category, but it does lower them from say upwards of roughly 100 micrograms per yolk to averaging maybe 50 micrograms per yolk. 
but but yeah, they can be sources that are relevant for those in that reset stage. And again, for any of these foods, we have to take them in the context of a full day's diet. I mean, we talked about the salt there. I mean, that can easily put you over just with salt, let alone any of the foods you're eating. So if you want to eat a couple of eggs, that that might be hard to fit in, to stay in that realm with, with you know, all your other meals and, and salting of your food and stuff like that in a day. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is if you're looking at making several choices here and there, you know, someone gave this analogy they got these uh, these Chuck E. Cheese places. Like they, the kids went back there a few times in the day, and so there's there's like horrible pizza and like all this chaos going on, and and then the kids get these tickets. They're playing all these games, like this handful of tickets, and they go trade it for worthless plastic things that are like the holy grail to them in the moment, you know. So <laughs> the yellow light foods, it's like you got a handful of tickets. You can get whatever you want, you know. You got you got a lot of options. You can't get everything you want, but you can get a couple of any things you want. So. Yeah, you, you can once you get it figured out as far as the big things to watch out for, you can manage quite readily and have plenty of options. <laughs> and Alan, I jumped right over seafood. Let's come back to seafood and talk about that. What are the biggest um, players when it comes to things to watch out for? And then what are some of the safer seafoods if we want to include them, you know, sparingly? Yeah, so during that whole reset stage, most ocean foods are suspect. You know, most can be past that threshold. Uh, fresh water fish is almost never, never a factor. I was surprised how many species there are of fish that can be either found freshwater or saltwater. You know, I grew up in northern Minnesota. Walleye was always a treat. And I had no idea walleye could also come from the ocean, but apparently it can. So yeah, uh, trout, same thing. So yeah, so freshwater fish, really not an issue. See from the ocean, there's a couple of things that the amounts we use are generally not all that high. And that ends up even though the concentration is there, the absolute quantity ends up being lower for iodine. So anchovies, you know, some types of sardines can be lower. Uh, funny thing, one of my favorite foods that came out of all this was, was squid. And I only had before the, the little round things that were chopped up, and I was kind of been different about those. But I read up on squid steaks. So they're, I don't know if you've had them before, but I, it was kind of a new thing to me. They're, they're just like these almost perfect rectangles with rounded edges. And they're, they're a really nice texture. They're not like rubbery. And so you just sear them really good, you know, salt, pepper, some lemon, maybe some basil. And it's, it's just amazing. And then I also heard from a lot of my friends who are deep into ocean sustainability. And it's just one of the top of the list foods as far as safe and not creating overfishing or problems that way. So that, that was one of my favorites that I came away from that with. Interesting. I've had the calamari rings like you talk about, but I've never had the steak form. So yeah, I see it frozen quite a bit. If you've got like a, a Whole Foods or something, they'll often have fresh versions. But the frozen is great. And it's also quite cost effective as far as seafood goes. And yeah, it's nice texture, very neutral flavor and very easy to cook. What are some of the other foods across the board that are, are big hitters when it comes to iodine content? You know, uh, processed grain products are amongst the most variable. And it's, it's so bizarre. You know, you could go quite literally buy a, a bag of, of processed bread and analyze side-by-side -side slices and see different amounts of iodine content by a lot. There are many breads that can contain, remember we said up to 200 for general health and up to 100 for improving thyroid function. You can go buy breads that have 1,100 micrograms per slice. You know, it's not, not uncommon. And something else I learned, you know, I've always said that when you pick up some food and there's like a long paragraph of ingredients that are not words you'd see walking around on a farm or, you know, growing in the ground, <laughs> that by itself is a concern, but it's not even all on the label. So what happened was researchers were looking at the labeling because some breads are labeled saying they use iodized dough conditioners. And some people thought, oh, heck, that must be it. These must be the ones that are so high in iodine. So they grabbed a bunch that said that and a bunch of others that didn't say that and then analyze their iodine content. And <laughs> it was not at all predictive. So there are ways iodine is used in bread processing. And by bread, I should expand, you know, rolls, muffins, croissants, biscuits, cookies. It's not what you would make at home though. It has no relevance to homemade foods, but things made in a store. And it's not just what would appear on the label. So yeah, one more thing not to love about processed foods, as many ingredients as there are you don't want, there's more ingredients you don't even know of. <laughs> While we're talking about bread, let's get into gluten because you have kind of a different perspective on this than a lot of other health and wellness leaders. And I know, again, through my wife and, and her Hashimoto's and going on the AIP diet, 
where you're actually eliminating all grains. So you're not just going gluten-free, you're actually going grain-free. And this is often used, you know, for people with Hashimoto's as a way to bring their antibodies down and, and try and alleviate their symptoms. But you've talked about in your research when it comes to thyroid that you haven't found any compelling research when it comes to gluten and, and a negative impact on the thyroid. So I'd love for you to talk more about that. You know, and another cool insight that went on in my head as I was writing this last book was uh, there's tons of folks who have done regimes like that and, and you know, they, their experience is that it was helpful for them. But then I look at the, the science and go deep in the molecular mechanisms. I'm like, huh, gluten really doesn't do that. I mean, maybe if someone has celiac, but, but then what I realized is that the, the biggest two factors that affect thyroid autoimmunity. So number one is iodine. That's like by far and away the biggest one. The second one is a type of inflammatory molecule called an adipokine. So we hear a lot about cytokine, cytokine storm these days. So adipokines are cytokines that come from fat cells. So the upshot of that is any diet that lowers your iodine and maybe bonus, you drop a few pounds, you could radically decrease inflammation on your thyroid just by those two things. And it might not even matter how you change your diet, but if you achieve those two goals, that can make a big positive difference. The AIP diet cuts out nearly all of the high sources of iodine that are common. And I've done some analysis showing that an average AIP menu will have maybe a fifth the iodine of a standard American diet. And for many people, a lot of their iodine is coming in from the, the processed grain products. And so if someone goes gluten-free, those things are just completely gone. And another controversial area kind of in that realm is people with Hashimoto's looking at their antibodies and assuming that is the end goal, the gold standard to bring those down to see that their thyroid's healing. And you talk about in the book at the frequently asked questions at the end that that's not necessarily the best way to go about looking at it. So again, not something I've heard talked about. Explain more what you mean by that. You know, I look at large studies of uh, how antibodies predict pred predict disease progression. And for one thing, antibodies can fluctuate a lot, meaning that if you check them every day for a month, you'll probably not see the same reading more than once. But the, the correlation with disease progression, there, there is one, but it's not, not that strong. So over the course of nine years, those with high antibodies have about a 5% greater risk of disease progression than those that do not. And then the other thing we now know is that they're, they're often there when there is autoimmune disease, there was a dumb old joke I heard about the, the policeman. He saw this, this man stumbling around an alleyway, obviously inebriated, and he's looking on the ground. He goes, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I lost my keys. And he goes, well, you shouldn't be driving anyway, but did, did you lose them out here? He goes, no, I lost them back in the back over there. He goes, well, why are you looking here? He goes, well, the light's better over here. You know, I couldn't see it. It was too dark over there. <laughs> and so there's a lot of things that we measure that are not the best thing to measure, but they're the easiest thing to measure. You know, that we got, we got better light there, you know, even that's not where the keys are. So thyroid antibodies, they're like that. They're not the actual things that are damaging the thyroid, but the things that are, are things that we cannot clinically measure. Another common thing that is talked about when it comes to people suffering with thyroid conditions is goitrogens and specifically cruciferous vegetables in the food realm. So what are your thoughts on consuming these if your thyroid's already having troubles? Yeah, so big, big context. You know, our, our food gives us macronutrients, our proteins, our fats, our carbs. It gives us the micronutrients, the vitamins, minerals. We often talk about phytonutrients. There's more awareness of that. People think about superfoods that have a lot of phytonutrients. The, the honest concept is that phytonutrients are phytotoxicants. You know, they're things that plant makes to protect themselves. They're, they're insecticides, they're herbicides, they're, they're, they're pesticides, they're naturally occurring pesticides. And by luck of evolutionary time together, when we consume those in the amounts we would typically find in foods and in the context of a normal diet, those, those poisons are just the right amount to make us better. You know, like uh, one of the most common goitrogens is a thing called glucosinolate, and that's in cruciferous vegetables. And when we eat broccoli, we get some glucosinolate that hits our liver. And if there was some twisted way by which someone could, could isolate that and take a massive quantity and have it actually reach their liver, there, there are a few things that be more, more poisonous. It's just deadly. But in the amount we get in the context of food, it hits our liver and liver says, oh, wow, it's tough, tough world out there. I better, I better beef up. I better get myself ready for action, you know? And so you get better liver function from that. So yeah, there's a whole category of these phytotoxicants that can actually be helpful. Now, some of them can also change iodine absorption. 
So in those historical contexts, when there were cultures that were marginal on their iodine status, these things could make it just a little bit worse if that was a big part of the diet. So areas that had endemic goiter in the 60s, and if their diet was high in you know, millet or something, the rate of neck enlargement or goiter might go from a baseline of 20% up to a baseline of 24% on a high goitrogenic diet. So almost no relevance in the modern world. You know, I've, I've practiced for 25 years. So I've seen a lot of stuff. And I saw one young boy who his diet for about six months was almost exclusively raw broccoli and like pounds and pounds a day in the blender. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. That was like 95 or more percent of his whole food intake. And he got a goiter from that. Uh, his dad brought him in to see me and I saw his labs. I saw, I saw his neck. I saw his reports. And the, the whole remedy was just to knock it off, you know, eat, eat good food, but eat a lot of food and different food categories. And he got better. So I wouldn't say that it's not possible to overdo <laughs> goitrogenic foods, but if you have more than that in your diet, it's not only is it not an issue, but the very things that make those foods categorized as goitrogenic are things that make those foods good for us in other reasons. Coming back to the story about that kid and the broccoli, why was he doing that? Was he trying to treat a health condition or did he just like broccoli? I can't imagine that would taste very good. You know, if you can think about what you and I might've been like in our late teens, uh, early adulthood, oftentimes young guys are impressionable and pretty, you take things to the, to just run with it, just go all the way with something, good idea or bad. And <laughs> so he, he saw a motivational speaker, a pretty famous one who at the time was pushing for a diet mostly raw vegetables and talking about some vegetables being better than others. And this kid heard that and goes, oh, well, if, if that's the best and if broccoli's the best, I'm just going to eat broccoli. And he did. I'm like, okay. <laughs> you mentioned the fact that it was raw. That pops into my head the thought of, you know, there's different ways we can also prepare these veggies that are goitrogenic. Like we can ferment them, we could steam them, we could stir fry them. Do you find that makes a difference if somebody's a heavier consumer or is it just not a concern at all? You know, apart from it being perhaps like 60% of your diet or more, it's not a concern. I, I I like them all those ways you mentioned, and some raw here and there is great too, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that other way. What about soy? Another controversial food. And when it comes to the thyroid specifically, is this something people that are, you know, if they're either borderline and, and having symptoms of a thyroid condition or if they're known to have Hashimoto's or some other thyroid condition, are they safe to consume? You know, here's my evolution on that one. So for a while, I didn't have a lot of thoughts either way. Um, then probably, I guess, late 90s, early 2000s, many of my friends were in the thyroid space. We're talking more and more about it being a bad thing. And somehow or other, it, it drifted into my writings. I put it in the avoid list and I hadn't given it a lot of thought in all honesty. And I, I'm not proud of saying that I said that without thinking it through very well, but I did. Uh, I had a friend who shared with me a paper that he had written going through evidence about beneficial effects of soy in terms of cardiovascular disease, breast cancer risk, bone health, menopausal symptoms. And his take was, you know, if your people really should avoid that, perhaps, but if it's if it's a not a big deal, there may be some benefits they're missing out on. And so it encouraged me to really not make assumptions and dig deep. So I dug deep, but also I reached out to all my thyroid expert friends and I said, hey, you guys, um, show me, send me the data, you know, send me the studies. And I, I don't really have a bone in the fight here or a dog in the fight, I guess, but I don't really care what happens. I just want to figure this out and send me whatever references you have that have supported the conclusion about soy being harmful for the thyroid. And what happened was there was basically, uh, there was like three recurrent pieces of data. One of which was a long time ago when they first started making infant formulas with soy, they didn't understand the distinct binding patterns from one protein to the next on minerals. You know, case in point, uh, casein in dairy has a certain affinity for iron. And so knowing that when you make an infant formula and it's got cow's milk, let's say just making up numbers, these are not correct numbers, but let's say that you want the baby to receive three milligrams of iron per day. And let's say that the baby's getting 10 grams of casein. Knowing the binding affinity, you've got to put six milligrams of iron because half is going to get bound up and it'll all work out okay. And again, made up numbers. <laughs> so, so, but they didn't know how that played out between soy and iodine. So the first versions of formula, they because the babies in these cases are getting all their nutrients from the formula and they need some iodine. So the first versions of that, they, they just put in how much iodine they thought the babies needed and they didn't know to make a correction factor. 
And there were some babies that had goitrogenic effects from that because they were really just undertreated on iodine. Once that was learned and the correction factors were made, it became a non-issue. But that set an idea in motion about, ha, huh, maybe soy was bad. And well, yeah, in that context. So the next thing that happened, and this is bizarre, I have no explanation for this one. There was, and I'm sorry, and I'm, I'm skipping over massive amounts of studies that, that yielded no effects whatsoever. So these are the three things that suggest there might be some effect. So the other study that suggests there might be some effect, they purported that siblings, so if, uh, and I've got a younger sister, so if we were in this study and I consumed soy formula, she would have a higher risk of thyroid disease per this study. Now, explain that to me by some biological common sense. <laughs> no, nobody could. It was never replicated. It made no sense, but that's a study that's out there, and it was not even a large effect size. The last one, the only one study that it all hinged on, there's a thing called subclinical hypothyroidism, which means your thyroid has not shut off, but it looks like it's going to, but you, and you, ha you yet have no symptoms from that. So you feel fine, your TSH is up, everything else is normal. That's subclinical hypothyroidism. And this paper said higher soy diets worsened the lapse rate of subclinical hypothyroidism into overt hypothyroidism. I'm like, wow, this might be the smoking gun. So I read the, read the full paper. And it turned out they had two groups of people, all of whom had subclinical disease and all of whom were on soy diets, all of whom were on soy supplements but one group had a higher dose of soy supplements than the other, and they did have more of a lapse into overt hypothyroidism. What they didn't talk about was the baseline rate of lapse. You know, how many of them should have become hypothyroid anyway? And the number that we see is about 6% per year of those with subclinical disease that lapse into hypothyroidism. So I did the math and it turned out that the, the group on a high soy diet, high soy supplements, they were about seven, seven and a half percent per year conversion. They did get a bit worse on, on the group aggregate. However, the group that was on soy supplements and, a, and still a so high soy diet, they had a lower lapse rate into hypothyroidism than, than the baseline would have predicted. So a big made analysis was done in 2019 and it pulled together 4,582 studies. I'm pretty sure I'm right on that. I looked at that just a few days ago. And their consensus was that just there's no effect. There's just no effect of soy on thyroid disease. But in women, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, yeah, menopausal symptoms, cardiovascular health, bone health, breast cancer. And recently, we've now got the most definitive thought on breast cancer. For a while, we thought, huh, soy is estrogenic. Maybe it makes it worse. Who knows? So the final study looked at women who had hormonally sensitive breast cancer. And after treatment, they put them in two groups. One group had a rather high soy diet on purpose. One group had none. And they watched recurrence and they watched death rates, you know, just like hard outcomes. And those who were avoiding soy had higher rates of breast cancer recurrence and higher rates of death than those who were deliberately consuming soy. So we now know that overall soy is preventive for breast cancer. And it's not only that, it's actually helpful for those who have had it before. Interesting. And for you specifically, is that a big part of your diet, soy products? Um, it's part of my diet. It's something I don't avoid. I, I have it probably a few times a week, uh, yeah, several times a week, different soy foods. Okay, let's move out of the food realm now and into cosmetics. So it's not just the foods we're eating. We got to be aware of these other things as well. And we're going to get into a few of them. Let's start with cosmetics and talk about what are the common cosmetics that we should look for that could contain iodine? And how do we go about determining if it does and how much? You know, this was a big epiphany for me in writing the book too. So yeah, we've known for a long time that iodine does absorb across the skin. Uh, it's about four and a half percent if you've got more than a few centimeters exposed and it sits there for more than two minutes. But we, we now know also that it was a problem in healthcare workers, that iodine in hand sanitizers was causing higher rates of thyroid disease and it was banned from them a few years ago. There is now work looking at the same issue in other skin products, but there have yet to be legislative actions taken on that. So I did a lot of math on this and thought about it. There's, there's a lot of things, you know, my, my wife's been in the beauty pageant modeling world forever, and she's got all these vials and containers of all sizes. And I, I don't know what almost all these things are, but, <laughs> but, but a lot of that stuff, there's not that much that actually goes into your body. So like good case in point, like mascara, you know, you're not, there's not like a blob of mascara that goes into your bloodstream. You know, a speck of it goes on your eyelashes, right? So, but then there's things to where 
you know, body lotions, uh, conditioners, uh, face creams to where you use a fair amount. You know, I went in the bathroom with a gram scale and pumped some things into cups. And yeah, you can do 10, 20, 30 grams of those products quite easily. And remember with iodine, we're talking about micrograms. So that 20 grams, that's going to translate us into, you know, 20 million micrograms. So you start out with that much. And if you absorb four and a half percent, but it's not all iodine, you know, ingredients. The big one is PVP in most common products. There are other names for that that I've written about in the book. And then natural products, they call the same thing kelp extract or sea vegetable extracts, you know, and there's names for those too. But those might be, if that's as low as half a percent, you know, it's like half a percent to 3% is common when it's used. And of PVP, it's about 12% iodine. So you take this 20 million, you go, you know, 12%, um, half a percent, four and a half percent absorbs, and you keep chopping it down. But even after all that, you've got like, two, 3,000 micrograms that can come into your bloodstream from one product. And again, that's one product. What I talked about before, we have to add all this in. And within a day, if you're consuming, again, sea salt, thinking it's healthy and having a moderate amount of that and having seafood or sea vegetables and, and things that we've typically been told are, are good for us in the food realm, it's just, again, how all that can pile up on, on one another and create havoc in the body. Yeah. Why are they putting iodine in cosmetics? What does it do for the product? You know, iodine is a super convenient compound. It's it, it makes it makes creams silky. It makes them not separate and get all sludgy and you know a wet part and a cl clumpy part. It also makes them less apt to get rancid. You know, it's, it's antimicrobial, so it's incredibly useful. And if we look back over the arc of the last century, it was used for tons of things in medicine and, and health and consumer products. But they keep chopping it out of things because they find safer ways to achieve the same goals. And just for clarification, we keep saying iodine, but in the book you specify this is actually iodide typically. <laughs> and then when it gets in the thyroid, it converts to iodine, correct? That's a cool point. So yeah, iodide is the reduced and oxidized form. I always imagine like there's this archetype of a, you know, guy that's got the Einstein hair and he's got like these massive leather gloves and these long set of tongs. And there's this smoldering cauldron, you know, he's holding it arm's length away. And that's kind of what iodine is. It's like super volatile and reactive. And so you, when things work right, your body only does that in designated safe spaces. And so, yeah, we concentrate it and activate it inside the thyroid. If there's massive amounts in our body, we can't help but have it activate elsewhere. And that's, that's why it's lethal. You know, that's why they had the skull and crossbones on those bottles back in the day. It's, it's a fatal thing. That's where iodine is made in the liver and the kidneys. But yeah, normally it's in the form of iodide in the body. Earlier, you talked about the fact that it can be absorbed through the skin. And I know there was some talk, I, it might've been something I read on the internet or in the health and wellness space about using that as a specific test to see if you're iodine deficient. So you could take this this liquid, and I've actually done it because I picked up a bottle, this is years ago, thinking, you know, I'll add this into my health and wellness regime. I, you know, I've been in this world for a long time and always trying different things. And I would put it on my skin and then watch it absorb in. So talk about the myth of that and how people sometimes are thinking that, you know, you can use that as a test to see if you need more iodine. You know, I think sometime in the nineties, I did that myself and I wasn't, it was, it was kind of there. I wasn't really sure how to, how to interpret it, but <laughs> so it's a plausible sounding idea. You know, you, you put it there and the, it makes this dark stain and over some time, the stain fades away a couple of days. And so the idea is if your body needs it, it just sucks it right on in. And if you are already good on iodine, you leave it there longer and get plausible sounding. Uh, the tough thing is that, oh, and I guess the, the partial truth is that our intestinal tract, there are some examples of compounds that we adjust our absorption per our nutritional status. We've got various uh, ferroprotein compounds that take in more iron when we're low and less iron when we're high. There's actually, that's why some people genetically build up too much iron is they can't adjust that properly. However, we've got nothing like that on our skin. You know, there are many things that by happenstance do enter our bloodstream from our skin, but the body is not really calibrated for that or expecting that. So we've got no ways those things adjust. And this was, this was looked at in 1932. They took different types of skin from uh, sources that were healthy, unhealthy, iodine sufficient, iodine deficient, and even cadaver skin. 
and they painted on a lot of iodine instead, a lot of stopwatches, and just no correlation whatsoever. It was totally debunked in 1932. If it did work, it would have saved countless amounts of effort from all the millions of samples of iodine that were analyzed from researchers around the globe. It would have been a much more cost-effective way to have done that. But yeah, and you mentioned iodide and iodine. So iodide is clear and iodine is colored. So when you take Lugol's iodine or you take betadine swabs, the iodine portion has that color. And so when it interacts with the oxygen in the air, much of that oxidizes into iodide. So it's mostly just becoming transparent. Some of it we do absorb, but not in a predictable way. But most of it just might still be there, but it just becomes invisible. That's interesting. Let's talk about medications. This is an area people might not even realize could contain iodine. I mean, up until reading your book, I had no idea. How many medications is this in? And what are the typical ones that people might be taking that contain iodine? You know, there's a rather detailed list to be comprehensive. Thankfully, there's not a lot of common ones in use. There's not a lot of ones that are just used that much. The one that gets talked about the most is called amiodarone, and it's a it's a medicine for irregular cardiac function. Uh, my my father, it's it's never given lightly. You know, cardiologists they know that it's fraught with side effects and harmful, and they're not giving it on a whim. It's only when they have no other options to regulate heart rate that they use it. Yeah, I almost lost my dad from that a couple of years ago, but it's it's a big deal. And they've tried to see how much of the side effects relate to iodine in it and how much don't, but that's a big part of it. So yeah, there are probably ne next most common thing would be contrast agents for CT scans or MRIs. Those are also going by the wayside. There's different forms of gadolinium. Some of the earlier ones were harder on the kidneys for some people. The newer ones, not as much of an issue, but largely gadolinium has replaced iodine. None of the thyroid medications though, right? Oh no, they all have a fair amount. Uh, okay, well this is important because obviously somebody who's already suffering from a thyroid condition and they're continuing to take iodine in, that's that's somebody who most importantly needs to watch out for this. So, so talk about that. Well, so... I want to preface this by having people not be frightened about the amount because if you're if you're taking appropriate amounts of thyroid medication, it's really just a wash from what you would have made from your own thyroid. So there's really not a net increase of your iodine. If your dose is above your targeted needs, then yes, the extra amounts become relevant. Um, natural desiccated thyroid, most common medication per a one grain dose, there's about 130 micrograms of iodine, which again ends up being a wash though from the hormones. So yeah, it is there. But someone won't, that that doesn't really go into the day's iodine total. <laughs> that sits aside from that. What about supplementation? People that are taking supplements specifically th for the thyroid or just supplements in general. Let's talk about some of the biggest culprits there. Yeah, that's a big deal. And this goes back to iodine being such an unstable thing again. So first off, it's there. A lot of them have it when it's really not not helpful. You're probably better off doing less anyway. But then they don't have what they say they have. You know, one big assay rounded up 120 popular products. It analyzed them and it compared the labeled iodine to the actual iodine. Uh, none were even in the ballpark. None were within 5% of what the label said. And many had three to four times what the label said. So yeah, I highly encourage those with thyroid disease, really, really just across the board to avoid any supplements that contain iodine. And then there are some supplements that are just iodine supplements. Like that's their whole reason for being. And those just break my heart. Um, there's a condition called congenital hypothyroidism. And that's where babies are born with like no thyroid function. And something we didn't mention yet is that the paradox is your thyroid needs iodine. But if your thyroid was just directly tied to making hormones based on iodine content, it would make lethal amounts of hormone at any iodine excess. You know, whenever you got a little bit extra, you would make so much hormone, you would, you would you'd damage your heart. You'd die from that. So your thyroid has a safety mechanism. When you're flooded with iodine, you shut off your thyroid. So there's, there's now uh, three different published papers in the medical databases about a supplement called iodorol. And they mention it by name and they talk about how the naturopathic or functional practitioner recommended this to pregnant mothers. Uh, one mother had twins. And these were babies that had been born with congenital hypothyroidism. So mom was consuming these supplements, which the lowest potency is 6,000 micrograms. Again, 200 is upper limit for normal people. 
The higher potencies are 50,000 micrograms. These moms were consuming 12,500 micrograms of iodine in tablets as they were pregnant. And so that extra amount just shut off the baby's chance of growing a thyroid. And these babies were born with, with thyroid scores hundreds of times outside of the normal range. So that, that's just one example, but these things have no medical purpose. And it just breaks my heart that they're popularized and used. What about prenatals in general? Do those often contain iodine? And if so, how do we go about, or not we, but how would women go about taking these in a healthy way if they're trying to get pregnant? Yeah, upwards of about 20, 25% of prenatals do not contain iodine. That number is increasing now that the data has been changing on that. So that's the simplest thing is just to use ones that do not contain it. Okay. And say you're somebody who's realizing my lifestyle, my supplements, maybe even my medication, like I'm getting way more iodine than I need. Like this is very unhealthy for me. Other than just abstinence and taking a break from the things that are going into the body. Just are there, no. <laughs> yeah, just say no. Are there certain things that we can take to facilitate helping clear that from the body quicker? Yeah, yeah. Great question. So in general, we all have our window of iodine tolerance. And to some extent, that's hardwired. To another extent, that can be worsened by being low in other key nutrients. Uh, top of the list there is selenium. You know, if we're if we're low in selenium, whatever capacity we have to fluctuate iodine is just that much narrower. So it's not that selenium makes us immune to the harmful effects of iodine, but having adequate amounts of it gives us a bit more of a buffer range. There's similar stories to be told for zinc and iron as well. So most all nutrients have some role to play, but those, those three have by far the biggest effects. And of them, selenium is really just top of the list. And selenium you talk about in the book, we can get that from Brazil nuts. You also talk about supplementation as well, but how many Brazil nuts would somebody need to take in a day to get a significant amount? You know, this has been a fascinating thing too. So I've known about them having it forever, them having pretty variable amounts. All minerals can be toxic at some point. And so for many years, I told people, yeah, do one or two. And I knew that some might end up not getting enough per the various batch or the very the variabilities, but I didn't want people to get too much and be have harmful effects on that. So a big study was done in, in Brazil, you know, Brazil, that's in Brazil. And I don't know if they would have sat me down and asked me if I thought the study was a good idea, I would have asked them not to do it. I wouldn't have thought it was a good idea, but they didn't ask me, they did it. And they had these, these kids, these preschool kids that were malnourished and they had Brazil nuts comprise about a third to a quarter of their caloric intake. So they ate massive amounts of Brazil nuts and they analyzed their selenium in their blood, their hair, their, their nails. And what they saw was that we now know Brazil nuts are almost exclusively a form of selenium called selenocysteine. And the cool thing about that is we can make great use of it and we can dump the excess quite harmlessly. So these kids were much healthier than their peers that weren't loaded up on Brazil nuts. They had massive amounts of selenium in their nails and their hair. They were excreting it but their blood levels were great. They were not at all toxic or harmful. That's not true of all selenium sources, but Brazil nuts were really not likely to overdo it. So given all that, now I say two to four is a good intake for adults. And are you a fan of supplementing with that as well? In small amounts. And the odd thing is that in most cases, it seems that supplements are foods. You know, if a food is there and can suffice, a supplement might not be necessary. But the data suggests that they may almost have parallel parallel benefits for thyroid function. There's been data showing that supplemental selenium may improve thyroid antibody status, and it, it may not be only in those who are selenium deficient. So I do encourage 50 micrograms through supplementation. I really do like selenocysteine for the reasons that came up earlier. And then also a couple Brazil nuts. There are tons of other food sources that have some selenium, but with those Brazil nuts, they're just like in a class by themselves. You're just, you're, you're fine on it afterward. And then for somebody who is taking on this diet, they're trying to clean up their iodine excess in their body. What are some of the other lifestyle things that they want to consider at that time and beyond? But what are some of the things that can really help facilitate this time and this, this reset in their life? You know, it's a funny thing. There's a word I heard recently. Let me get this right. Yeah. Uh, monocausal taxophilia. <laughs> Monocausotaxophilia. So if you break it down, mono is one, you know, cause, causal, you know, causal, taxo, so nomenclature, categorization, and philia, love of. So that's the love of, of a single explanation. <laughs> and I don't want to fall into that trap and say it's all about iodine, 
But researchers have said that iodine is not the only factor that drives thyroid disease, but it's more important than all the other factors combined. So, so yeah, it's a big deal. And the other factors, even if they're not as critical on thyroid disease, they are critical for overall health. So I do talk about the importance of covering the basis on you know, a variety of foods in the diet, nice balance of macronutrients, uh, the importance of exercise. There's good data about that being an important, relevant factor for thyroid health. Maintaining a good body weight, you know, sleep, uh, social connections, managing the stress response. So all those things are great. And I, and I do touch on those. There's not, I don't know, my thought is that there's so much of a new message I wanted to focus on. I didn't want to take a lot of bandwidth to say things people have already heard before. You know, they're important, they're good, but this is something new that if you add this in can really switch things for you. It is so true. This message to me is totally new. When I dug into your book, I had, you know, no idea about, you know, how this information, how profound it is. And and this this book is just so important. I'm curious, are there other people out there that are sharing this similar message because I'm heavily involved in, in the ongoings in the health and wellness space. And I haven't heard anybody talk about any of this. You know, it's a funny thing. Um, it still just completely baffles me how strong this data is, how many lines of evidence we have showing these same things, you know, large human clinical outcome studies. And yeah, you're right. This is something that I wasn't seeing several years ago until the data became more clear. So all those that I've talked to, my, my thyroid expert friends, the thyroidologists that I collaborate with, the conventional thyroid people, it makes perfect sense to them. And they they get on board, they recommend it, they they're they are they are behind it. But but yeah, it's something that I think this this is really at its infancy in terms of the the spread of the understanding. And earlier when you talked about different lifestyle factors that people want to consider just to maintain, you know, health if you're suffering from a thyroid condition or just in general as well. You mentioned exercise. And one thing I want to point out there is, and this is something that I know my wife came across when she was going through her Hashimoto's and it was more of an issue. She's She has it under control now, but back a couple few years ago, and that's not over-exercising. So it's often talked about, you know, exercise, the benefits of that, but there's also the other, that's a double-edged sword. There's also the other end of that where we want to make sure, especially as we're healing and we have a thyroid condition, we're being moderate uh, with how hard we push our bodies. You know, it really is. And it really depends where someone is at in that continuum. There's an idea, um, Jonathan Jonathan Haidt, he's an author I enjoy his work greatly. And he argued that one of the most dangerous ideas that's become prevalent is the idea that that which doesn't kill us makes us weaker. <laughs> he argues that we need to think more about the fact that, you know, they've called the term anti-fragile where the things that stress us in a useful degree make us stronger. And there definitely are those who are training more than they're ready for. And they, they, they can, it's not a good thing. It's harmful for them. But it really is where you are in your whole exercise dosage history. You know, uh, I, I hear a lot of people who get that message and they needed to get it because they were just overdoing it in some ways. But I also hear a lot of people that hear that message and they're scared to move their bodies. <laughs> That's, and that's, that's, not, that's not a helpful thing. I just had to talk to someone a few days ago to where she was training for her first half marathon. Um, she was managing thyroid disease. She was feeling great from that and everything was doing better than ever. And her doctor said, oh no, you're going you're gonna to kill yourself. You're going to create free radical stress. You're making inflammation. You got to stop all that. And she's been miserable since then and just gaining weight and things were getting worse. Her scores were all worsening. And I'm like, oh yeah, well, go back to your running. I mean, don't, don't start, don't go from zero miles a week to like 60 miles a week next week, you know, but 10% a week, build yourself back up again. I said, yeah, you're, you're not a, you're not a fragile snowflake. I mean, be, be reasonable. And she was working with a coach. I said, yeah, listen to your coach. And no, it's, yeah, it's a good, it's a good thing to be active. Like anything, you have to find that, that sweet spot in the middle and, and find the balance. Yep. So Alan, we've covered tons on, again, this subject that is, is totally new. I'm sure for a lot of people, as it was for me, any other areas when it comes to iodine and thyroid that we, we haven't talked about that we should? Yeah, I'd love to just briefly talk about the, the clinical outcomes that we see and what the study showed. You know, one of the studies that was representative of others, they took people who had Hashimoto's and it was an interesting thing. They worked pretty hard to find this group, but they found those to where they had had the disease for several years. Uh, they were not yet on medication for it and their levels had been rather stable for the prior year. Those are all three hard things to pull together, but but they did. And of them, they had average scores that were significantly low. Put some quick perspective on this. So 
one one marker we use a lot is the the TSH. It's not everything, but it's a simple thing that shows how much your body wants your thyroid to work. So if your thyroid were gone, your body would just scream for more help from it. The number would get very high. And if there's too much thyroid hormone, your body, you know, quits asking your thyroid to do anything because there's too much already. So it's it's backward. You know, low thyroid is a high TSH, high thyroid is a low TSH. And most labs say a normal range is like 0.4 to 4 and a half. A lot of research suggests that healthy people are probably better off close to one or two, somewhere like that. Anyway, the folks in the study, their average TSH was 14.1. They were extremely hypothyroid. And a lot of them had scores in the 50 to 200 range for their TSH. They were, they were off by like not subtle amounts. And they took them and for three months did what evolved into the thyroid reset diet. They targeted less than 100 micrograms of iodine and they did nothing else. They didn't go on selenium. They didn't go on thyroid medication. They didn't make lifestyle changes. They just did that one thing. So at the end of three months, those people, average TSH score of 14.1, 78.3% of them had perfectly normal thyroid function again. They were, they were, they were cured. They were normal. They were recovered. They had no, nothing wrong. They were asymptomatic. Uh, and, and it's bizarre. So that's already a pretty big win, 70.3. But of those that didn't get better, so what? Um, can I do that math quickly enough? 21.2? 71.7? Yeah, of the 21.7, uh, they were in a couple of categories. So one category, uh, they, they were found to not have reduced their iodine as much as was hoped. Either the instructions weren't clear enough or they didn't try. I don't know. I'm not going to guess. But however it was, they weren't on target. And so, yeah, they didn't get better. It's like the old thing about the lottery. You've got to play to win. And so they, they didn't win, but they weren't playing. So that's you can put that aside. Then there were those to where they weren't normal, but they were a heck of a lot better. So some that had the starting scores of like 200, they were down to 20. So they weren't in the normal range but they had made leaps and bounds. So they, they didn't go into that 70.3% cure rate, but they got a whole lot better. So they were a big chunk of that too. So, and then there were some to where they played, but they didn't win. You know, they didn't budge. They didn't get better at all. And they did things right. They comprised about 3% of the participants. So almost everyone got better, got mostly better, or we don't know, they didn't try. <laughs> and I'm just curious, well, sorry, go ahead. Oh, just last point. I forgot to mention they had had thyroid disease for an average of four years. So it had been going on for some time. I'm just curious, somebody who maybe they didn't have severe thyroid disease and they went on a protocol like your thyroid reset diet and they got things back to a normal range and the thyroid is was working optimally. Do they always have a susceptibility compared to somebody who didn't have thyroid disease or skewed that way? Like, are they always going to be more susceptible to having thyroid issues? Or once they heal that, are they are they back in maintenance phase with, with the quote-unquote regular people? They are back in maintenance phase. They are more susceptible than the general population. I think about whatever our window of iodine tolerance is. And for most of us, it's just not known. If someone knows they have thyroid disease, they know it's rather narrow. And if they know they were able to correct that by adjusting their iodine, then at that point, it's, it's somewhat broader. And yeah, then the maintenance phase is a great fit for them. All right, Alan, I think we've covered, well, we have covered a ton here. Unless you have anything else you think we need to cover before we part ways, other than the listeners getting the thyroid reset diet, how can they connect with you after the show? Yeah, uh, drchristensen.com, Dr. Christensen, S-O-N, that's the center of that. And the book is just wherever you get books, or most of us, that's Amazon these days. But if you got a local bookstore, you can give some love too. That's always great. <laughs> all right, I'm going to link it all up in the show notes. A pleasure chatting again, and I'm sure we'll do this again down the line. Thank you, Alan. Thank you so much, Jesse. This was awesome interview. Really good questions. Thank you.